Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Janessa, I'm an employee at the Office of Sustainability and we are the ones partnering also with SGA bringing you some of the speakers that are here for Earth Week and so I would just like to introduce our speaker for the evening. You will be hearing from Joan Maloof. She is the founder of the Old Growth Forest Network and has spent many, many years visiting old growth forests all across the country. She has also written several books about this topic as well. And so I, oh, and the books are also available out front if you want to check any of those out. So outside of the Laird room right here. And she's just going to talk to us tonight about old growth forests, where they are, why they matter and what they are. So I'll hand it over to her. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, happy Earth Day, everyone. This is my first time to Stevens Point, and um, you know, every time you travel, you go somewhere new and you learn new things. And what I learned here at Stevens Point is that there's such a thing as snow tanning. <laughs> <laughs> on a beautiful day like today when there's still snow on the ground and the sky is blue and the sun is shining. So I um, hope you all got to participate in that at some point today. Enjoy the beautiful weather. I'm going to move this here. When I um, talk with students, and it looks like the audience is mainly students, which is fabulous, I like to talk about my journey that got me to where I am today, saving old growth forests, because I remember being young and wondering how anyone ever figures a path and what things lead to the next. And uh, so a little bit of today's talk will be sharing that. So I, when I look back, I think I must have always loved plants. We, when we really look at ourselves, the journey to adulthood is partly finding our passions that take some time to show themselves. And for me, when I look back and I'm thinking about those moments that I had where I would study plants, where I would, in a way, fall in love with the forms and the textures and the smells. And then as I learned more about them and the functioning of them, came to appreciate them even more. And not just the static one-time view of a plant, but how the plants change through time, how you can start with a bud one day and three days later have the leaves emerge and then a few months later have the leaves turn color and fall and have the birds and the insects and the other animals time their visit with those plants too. So it's a magical complexity. And this is what I wanted to study when I was an undergraduate. So I am, this is actually my master's degree and I am looking down at a computer monitor that's showing the readout of carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide levels are being read from that clear plastic container in my hand that I have a leaf clamped inside. So this is a LiCor machine. Have any of you ever used this LiCor device to measure carbon dioxide uptake? Nobody yet? Well, it, I'll tell you, it makes the way that plants take in carbon very real because you clamp that leaf inside and you look down at the monitor and you can see the carbon dioxide levels dropping within that chamber. And when a cloud comes over the sun, the rate of carbon dioxide uptake slows down because of course the photosynthesis depends on the sunlight. And then the sun comes out again and it speeds up again. So the carbon in the atmosphere is although we can't see it, it's so closely tied to what our plants are doing every day. And as I was teaching my university classes later, I, every semester I'd have to change my notes because I could see that the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were increasing. 
So for my PhD, I was studying plant-animal interactions. This is in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab and became a full-fledged scientist, ecologist, publishing things in journals like the Journal of Botany and Ecology. But the more I learned, the more I became to appreciate not just the plants, but these interactions I'm talking about. So there's, this is an acorn, developing acorn from an oak tree and a little spring peeper frog. But if it weren't for those trees creating that habitat that's protecting that vernal pool, there would be no spring peeper there. And if there were no spring peeper there, there would be fewer or none of the salamanders that are in that pool. And if there were none of those salamanders, there would be none of the X, Y, Z. You know, you keep going and going, everything relying on everything else. Across the street from my home, not in my backyard, <laughs> but across the street, was this forest that had regrown. And this forest was only about 70 years old. This is in Maryland. So you could say this is nothing special. This had been a cleared agricultural field at one time. But the field was abandoned around the 1920s. The trees started growing in all on their own. No one planted them because the seeds were still in the environment and still in the ground. And what we had were the larger trees, com the trees coming in first, the pines, of course, the early successional species. And then coming in later were the oaks and the sweet gums and the black gums and the red maples. These are the Maryland species I'm naming, the tulip poplar trees, the hollies, the dogwoods, then the beech trees. So the, the successional development of the forest that many of you are familiar with. So as I was appreciating these ecological relationships, I would also watch every week another one of these second growth forests being taken down because they were nothing special. And I started asking around about where are the forests that are not going to be taken down? The second growth forests that we're going to leave standing to get older because there were no older forests in my community. And what I found was that there was not a single forest protected from timber harvesting in my county. So that meant none of these forests were going to be allowed to get older. The um, <clears throat> bottom picture in the center is one of our state forests. So even the public forests are being cleared. And what was happening there, the bottom right, is a pine plantation would take the place of that mixed native forest. And that would be on a short rotation, maybe 40 years. And then it would be planted in pine again, meaning that we'd never again have that full diversity. Not, certainly not the full diversity that we had in the past of the original forest that lived on that land, nor even the diversity of the second growth forest, but we'd have this um, crop, really. And E.O. Wilson, the famed conservation biologist, says that when you take a native forest and convert it to a pine plantation, you lose 95% of the biodiversity. And then to keep the other species from coming back, the maples and the gums and, and the beech and the holly and the dogwoods, these, field, these forests were often sprayed with herbicide to keep those others out. So I have no problem with timber being a crop. I have no problem with timber harvesting. This podium is made from wood. A lot of the things in this building, my books are made from wood. But I felt that there ought to be some places where these forests could age and we could maintain the biodiversity. <clears throat> so I took, a, I at first thought, what kind of scientific study can I do that will show that we should not be converting all these native forests? And I literally was designing studies in my mind of, well, maybe it could be the moss diversity in the forest. 
Figured that would decline when we convert it. Or maybe spider diversity, and I'd have to learn all the spiders. Or maybe snail diversity, and I'd have to learn all the snails. So it, these scientific studies, you probably know, take a while to design. They take a while, years, to accomplish, and then a while to write and publish. So it might take me three years, if I was lucky, to do the science to put something in a journal that would show that we're losing biodiversity in one type of organism <clears throat> when we convert this forest. And then I, I paused before I dove into that three years. And I thought, so I do that, and then what? Is it going to make a difference? Probably not. All these studies have been done before, not exactly the study with, that I was going to do, but for many different organisms, showing this loss in biodiversity with the continued timber harvesting. So I thought, well, I will take a break from what I've been doing, my scientific research, and instead I will write a book for the general audience that will explain these interrelationships of all these other organisms that depend on the trees. You're not just cutting the trees, you're removing the habitat for so many other species. And this would be a short break, and then I would go back to writing my scientific studies. And in this book, in the first chapter, I found out I described visiting an old growth forest. Now this old growth forest, it took me a little while to figure out where the closest unlogged forest was to me. And it turns out it was 60 miles away, and it was down all these dirt roads, and it was only 14 acres, but it was a beautiful forest, big forest. And when I walked into that forest, and I breathed the air in that space, I realized that there's something different about the air in an old growth forest. Because all of the leaves, and this happens in any forest, but particularly in a very biodiverse forest, you have all the living organisms in there giving off their gases. Even tree leaves, their cells off gas, right? They can't exhale like we do. They emit their gases into the atmosphere. And the fungi emit their gases into the atmosphere. The rotting soils, all those organisms emitting their gases into the atmosphere. And we breathe that in. So the, uh, when we inhale, the oxygen we you know is going into our lungs and going into our bloodstream. But also, all these other compounds are. So we're breathing the forest. And we know now, through the research, that when you walk through a forest, your blood sugar is lowered, your blood pressure is lowered, your uh, stress hormones are lowered. There are many positive effects. You can concentrate better. There, your immunity is increased. So we know that these forests are good for our health, but we don't know why, and it might have something to do with the air. So that was the first chapter in that book. And my readers came up to me and I kept getting the same question over and over. First they'd say, oh, I really like the book. I'd say, thank you. And they said, can you tell me how to get to that forest? I, I want to know how to get to that forest. I promise I won't tell anybody like it was a big secret where the forest was. Well, it wasn't a secret, but old growth in the East particularly hasn't been I'll say advertise the same way the Western old growth has. We all know that we can fly to California and get, go to Muir Woods and see old growth forests, but we may not know where the old growth forest is closest to us, or even if there is any, right? I remember being in high school and asking people about this, are there any unlogged forests left? And some people would say, oh, yeah, they're everywhere, and other people would say, no, there's none at all. And I had a hard time getting information about that. So by this response, I knew that people wanted to visit the old growth forest, but they didn't know how to get there. And so I decided I would write another book. And this one 
would be a visit to an old growth forest in each of the 26 eastern states. So the, all the states east of the Mississippi, I would visit one old growth forest, tell folks exactly how to get there and what I found when I got there. because I wanted people to know that there still was some old growth forest left in the east. Not much, but it's still there. So this is a travel book of sorts. And during the research for that book, I learned the true state of our original forests. So the graphs I'm showing you now, I'm gonna show you three, and they were done in 1925 by the first head of the US Forest Service, Greeley. We have another former head of the U.S. Forest Service here with us tonight, Mike Dumbeck. So this, this was his graph of where the original forests are on the American continent. The black, of course, forests, and the white are the places where forests can't grow in our country because of prairie or desert, things like that. So notice this is called virgin forest, and that was um, an older term for these forests that weren't um, thought of as commodities or hadn't been um, all clear-cut. And this was his estimate from 1620. But of course, not every single acre in this black area was big old trees because of course there were native people living here at the time and they had cleared some areas for their villages and their crops. And they were influencing the forest somewhat with their burn managements. And there was um, also the, the normal dis disturbances that happened to forests, forests, the blowdowns, the forest fires, tornadoes, things like that. But estimates are that um, little over half of the forest was the big old old growth. But with the European settlement, those original forests started being taken for export, a lot of them, to other nations that had already cut their trees and also used internally for so many, so many reasons for everything. We'll look at a little bit of that. And also sometimes just cleared and burned for, to create field areas. And by 1920, remember these graphs were made in 1925, this was the extent of the old growth forest. And we have continued to lose f our original forest since then. And note that by this time, there was also logging happening out west. And I learned about what the forests looked like before forests that we will not be able to see anymore, like the chestnut forests and the tulip poplar, you know, the chestnut blight got the chestnuts. You see those humans in there and how small they are. And I learned about the history of the removal of those forests. So this is the, the white pines in the 1800s and originally removed with animal labor and then with the development of industry with the railroads the cutting sped up this is a, a white pine from michigan this is 1926 photo from pennsylvania look at the amount of timber used just for that railroad trestle alone and then all the tracks across the country and then look at the logs on the back of the train this is washington state that entire trestle is made from trees and tree logged so a lot of the clearing that went on in this country was industrial logging. It wasn't just people clearing out their backyard and making space for their crops. It was on a large level, and frequently um, after the logging was finished, the fields were just left behind. The slash frequently caught on fire. And um, so these places became almost like wastelands in a way. 
and part of that the, that was part of the reason that we formed the National Forest was because people saw what was happening and realized we needed to protect our timber resource or it would be all gone. If you're interested in that history, there's a good book called American Canopy that describes it. So, and then trucks were invented and we could get even into places that the train cars couldn't go. So the result of all of this clearing, this map, if you look at the green and the yellow and you put them all together in your mind, sort of make them green, that was the extent of the forests on this continent originally. And then the, the yellow are the places where that original forest has been cleared. So the green shows the original forest or primary forest or old growth forest, whatever term you want to use. There's lots of terminology out there. And lots of people spend a lot of time arguing about it. <laughs> but for our sake, these are the relatively untouched forests still in green. And you can see that those are the harder ones to get to, the tropical forests and the boreal forests. But look at our nation and not much of that original forest left, although we still have timber cover a lot of places, not a lot of old growth. And how much old growth? That was a question that was asked in the late 80s and no one could answer it. We did not have any idea how much old growth was left in the East. And this um, woman, Mary Bird Davis, said, I think I'm going to take this task on. And she started calling people in each of the eastern states that she knew that worked for the national forest or worked for the state forest or the ecologist, anybody that knew anything about the timber in their state. And she created an exhaustive resource um, called the Eastern Old Growth Forest Survey. And that came out in 1992. And it showed that there was only 1% of our original forest left unlogged in the east. And in the west, the estimates are 5%. Where is this old growth? The largest remaining pockets, um, here's the list, mostly in the Adirondacks, although even then, in Adirondack State Park, Right, this is a state park. They had the foresight to keep a good chunk of their forest forever wild. And if you study water resources, you may know that the reason that they did that was not because they liked big old trees, it was because they were protecting the water resources of the state so that New York City would have enough water always. Um, the other Big pockets of acreages are in the Smoky Mountains, North Carolina and Tennessee. Um, moving on down the line, 30,000 acres in the Porcupine Mountains of Michigan and Congaree, South Carolina. It's a national park, huge piece of old growth, beautiful, and some others in North Carolina. The rest are pockets around. So I would encourage you, if you've never been to one of these old growth forests that you know of in the east, to take some time, um, visit one. I'm going to have a commercial now for a book that just came out this week. And it is the history and ecology of old growth forests in Wisconsin and where to find them. And it's by John Bates. And um, I would suggest this to anyone. Great history of the logging in this state and what's left with directions. Unfortunately, he's not here tonight to, uh, with copies for sale, but it's available on Amazon, Our Living Ancestors. And ideally, also get to one of these large pockets of old growth where you can walk for an entire day or two and not get out of it. And then you'll really understand it. Then you'll really feel the difference between a managed forest and an unmanaged forest. So in my journeys for this book, trying to figure out which forests I was going to and which states, you know, just sticking my 
my sticky notes there and I realized how far apart these places are. This 1% is so scattered, most of it very small. But I got to these places and what did I see? Yes, big old beautiful trees. This is in Sipsi Wilderness in Alabama, one of my favorite stops. And I learned to be able to estimate the age of a tree, not from the trunk diameter, which isn't the most, um, most useful way to tell the age. The most useful way is really looking up at the canopy in the crown. And if you see these wide branches that are, look kind of misshapen and kind of gnarly, instead of thin, beautiful, up-reaching branches, you have these fat ones that are twisting all over the place. Um, that tells me that that's an old tree. Here's another example of that. So the trunk might not even look that hugely wide, and, but you look at a crown like that and you know you're looking at an old growth. So this tree could easily be 326 years old. So if you listen sometimes um, to just forest management proponents, they'll talk about trees starting to go into decline after 90 years or 120 years. But I've seen many, many, many trees with my own eyes that live hundreds and hundreds of years. The, I learned about how important and prevalent the coarse woody debris is in the forest. So you have these big old trees, and when they come down, as they do, because they don't live forever, just like we don't live forever, you know, they'll live four times longer than we do, but they're eventually going to come down. And that coarse woody debris is home to so many organisms in the forest because it's going to be a place where the fungi grow. It's going to be a place where the beetles live and flee feed on the fungi. It's going to be a place where the um, where the amphibians and the reptiles are, and on and on. And there on the right, that white-looking, spiral-looking tree, that's an American chestnut in the Cook Forest. So there in that untouched forest, you can see the space that the chestnut trees held in our forest. So that tree is dead, but it's still a part of that ecosystem. And when it comes down, that carbon that it contained will go back into the ground. Just these, these standing snags that are so important for wildlife. So that, um, that dead tree to my right in the photo was a tulip poplar. I guess it's to your left. And that has um, a big cavity underneath where bears could actually den in these trees in our original forest because they were that large. So when we remove these large trees, we're removing habitat for a lot of organisms that need that structure of these hollow spaces in the trees, not just mammals on the ground, but also birds in the trees, in the tops. So I would drive from one of these sites to the other hours and hours and look at the landscape and think, really? We didn't leave anything between that one and this one? And, you know, the human race, some things we're not so efficient at, but we were really efficient at clearing those original forests. It's amazing to me that that there weren't more people standing up to say, no, you know, we want to leave 150 acres in our town unlogged, or we want to leave 50 acres in our village, or we want to leave 150, no, all gone. And I thought of the children in our country, and what is the, if the adults aren't even getting to these old growth forests and understanding them, What's the chance that the kids are getting to th see these old growth forests? And if they don't see these forests, how are they ever going to understand 
what our planet can do, what it looks like. How will they ever know that in this spot right here was this forest that was beautiful and diverse and had all this wildlife in it? And if they can't understand that because they haven't experienced it, then what hope do we have of ever letting these forests recover or preserving the forests that are left? Because if their generation doesn't understand, they won't care, and if they won't care, those forests won't be preserved. So this is the mindset I was in at this point. What can we do to reverse the destruction and improve our nation for future generations? Because it's easy to look back at what they did, right, in the late 1800s, but it's still happening, right? The second growth forest across the road from me was still going to be cut, and old growth pockets in areas are still being cut. So what can we do to stop it in our generation? And I was in New Hampshire, I believe, headed to an old growth forest when I thought we need an organization of people that will speak out to do this. I can't do this alone. And, it, and how are we going to do this? How are we going to let some of these forests recover to go from second growth to old growth and to make sure none of the old growth gets cut? And the scientist in me said, well, maybe if we do, if we preserve one forest in each county, then no child will be too far from any one of these forests, and they can visit this forest, and this, this forest will be protected from any future timber harvesting, and they can build a relationship with it, and they can love forests, and they can protect forests in the future. One in each county. That's all we need. That shouldn't be too hard. And then I went home, and I Googled counties in the US, Google Images. And this is what came up. <laughs> and I said, oh my god, <laughs> that's a lot of counties. Over 3,000 counties in the country, but remember, not every place in the country can support forest growth. So, but 2,370 of the counties can support forest growth, so that became the goal. One forest in each county protected from logging and open to the public, and that is the old growth forest network. That at some point in the future, there will be a protective forest that you know of somewhere near you and the next generations afterwards. And together, we're going to protect that network and make sure those forests stand. And called it the Old Growth Forest Network. Right? And I knew that I could not do that alone. <laughs> and I um, didn't have the financial resources to do it myself, so I was going to need some support so I could live. So that means a nonprofit organization needed to be formed, a 501c3 which we did in the beginning of 2012. And here's kind of what that would look like in Wisconsin. There's your counties. But in Wisconsin, not every county supports forest growth, right? You might have trees, but there are some prairie counties. And this shows the the original vegetation of Wisconsin. So the yellow, the bottom of the state, is the prairie. And the green, it, the light green next to the yellow is the oak savanna. And then all the um, darker green and the oranges toward the northern part of the state are the forests. So it's, as you know, I'm sure, Wisconsin is more forest to the north and um, more prairie types to the south. So even with a nonprofit organization, we couldn't do this with a staff of one, which is what we started out with, myself. And so 
we need volunteers. So we got other people that were interested in this mission and wanted to help, and I hope that maybe some of you sitting here today might want to help too, because this is my first time in Wisconsin talking about this, and we could really use a lot more people in Wisconsin um, looking for forests for the network. So the volunteers in each county, and if you're interested, I have these cards out on the front table out there. You can fill out your name and address and say, yes, I would like to be a county coordinator. And the county coordinator, what they do is they look around their county and they talk to the people that are in the know about the forests there. And they look at all of the forests that are existing. I mean, you don't have to visit every one, but you ask questions. And maybe the Nature Conservancy owns a forest, or maybe there's a state natural area, or maybe there's national forests somewhere, or maybe there's a land trust that owns some forests that's open to the public. So you consider all of these forests that are open to the public. Old growth is best if it exists. It does not exist in every county. So if it doesn't exist, we want to find one of those older second growth forests to protect. So then we need to make sure the forest is protected from logging. And you would be amazed at how many times people assume a forest that's open to the public that everybody loves is legally protected from logging, but is not. So we follow that thread. So for instance, the forest we went to today called Schmeekly, yeah, so I visited that today, and my first question is always, is this protected from logging? And I still don't know. I don't know. Maybe do you know for sure? Maybe you assume. But if it's not, things can happen, and I've seen things happen. I've seen at um, University of Virginia where they wanted to build a athletic practice stadium right over the top of an old growth forest that had 350 year old trees. Or I've seen places where all of a sudden the state decides to put a road through somewhere. Or I've seen um, university decide to build a, put up uh, university housing in a place. So often these forests are looked at as empty space, places where development can happen. So we need to make sure they're protected, open to the public, re relatively accessible. So right now, we in the network, we have, it's a nationwide project, remember? We have 20 states with forests in the network, and we have 70 forests in the old growth forest network. 70 forests protected from logging, open to the public, accessible. And if you want to know where any of them are, you can go on our website and click on the forest link, and it will give you full directions to that forest and how to visit it. And yesterday, we dedicated our first Wisconsin forest into the network. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it was uh, Cathedral Woods, Cathedral Woods in Oconto County. So now we have this organization that's going to build this network that's going to change the future. And it will ensure that future generations will have a relationship with the forest. But then the, the job gets even a little bit bigger than that because it's not just these old growth forests, but forest cover in general. When you look at what's happening to our planet, and it's so appropriate for Earth Day talk. So about 5,000 years ago, at the dawn of civilization, forests covered 46% of the land on planet Earth. And now that number is down to 30%. And that is entirely due to human activity. We have cleared these forests. We've converted the land to agriculture, whether it's crops or grazing or develop the area. And the, the United Nations monitors this. And every, year, every five years, they come out with the next new number of how much forest cover we've lost on the planet. So you see the numbers down there between 2000 and 2012. We lost 3.2% of global forest cover. We've never seen that number turn around in 5,000 years. We've never seen the global forest cover 
recover and increase. It just keeps going down. So what are we going to do about that? We know how much the, the forests are tied to our clean air, to our clean water, to our biodiversity. Here is Wisconsin. Let's see, can this happen? So on the left, it says pre-settlement forests of the Great Lakes states. Of course, Wisconsin's in the middle there. And the, the green are the great pine forests. And now look at Wisconsin on the right. Look how far that pine forest has shrunk. The forests in general have shrunk. And the yellow there is the aspen birch forest. And the reason that that forest type is increasing is because we, re we removed the pines and hemlocks. And now we have this early successional forest in there that we're keeping early successional forest because we keep harvesting that aspen and birch, mostly for pulp. So how much further is this going to go? And if there are older native forests, should we speak out to protect them? Re I remind you the importance of plants. Every year, 40% of the carbon and the majority of water circulating through the atmosphere moves through the pores in the plants, the stomata. The forests are removing 30% of the human carbon dioxide emissions in from the atmosphere. So these fossil fuels we're burning, the plants are doing their best. The forests are actually growing faster than they grew before we started emitting so much carbon dioxide. But they can't keep up. The levels keep going up. Most, well, half of that carbon is stored in the ground, in the roots and in the soil, not just in the above ground, in the trunks. It's like the forest is breathing, right? It is. Taking in the carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen and water vapor, cleaning the particulates, the nitrogen oxides, the sulfur oxides, the ozone from the atmosphere, cleaning that air. And when we clear those forests, we're not only interfering with that filtering mechanism of the air, but we're allowing that sunlight to strike the ground, kill the fungi in the soil, and allow the carbon to be released from the soil. So we're not only just stopping the um, oxi carbon dioxide uptake, we're increasing the release of carbon dioxide. So another thing I really got peeved about is when I would see an older forest, very biodiverse forest, and I would hear that this forest had to be managed to be healthy. And people that I knew, private forest owners, they had a forest and they thought, oh, should I be doing something with my forest? And they'd call somebody in, um, a forester would say, well, we got to manage that forest. You know, those trees are slowing down their growth, and we've got to, um, you know, get this generation out or thin this out and get the next generation in. So I decided I would do a little research, scientific research, because I'm still a scientist, and see, is this true? Do forests need to be managed to be healthy? And what I learned was, where do you find the biggest and the oldest trees? Should that be a measure of health? I think it would be, and I found the biggest and the oldest trees are in unmanaged forests. And we also know now that those old, big old trees remove the most carbon. We used to think that the trees got big and old and they slowed their growth and they're not taking in much carbon and it's better to cut those down and put in the young, fast growing trees and they're going to absorb the most carbon. That in the last eight years has been found to be untrue. What happens is those big old trees put on 
way more, they put on the weight of an average size tree in one year. They're doing all their growth in the top on those big limbs we we're talking about. So if you core the, the trunk, the rings won't look very wide. And so you'll think, oh, the growth is slow because those rings aren't wide. But look at the circumference of that trunk that that narrow ring is going around. And not only, just the, not only the trunk, but all the limbs. And so we now know that these trees never stop growing as long as they're alive. And they're putting on substantial amounts of wood, which means taking in substantial amounts of carbon. So I dove into the literature, and anybody who studied anything comparing old growth to managed forests, what did they find? And what I found was that the old unmanaged forests had more salamanders and more salamander diversity because the vernal pools could exist in the forest, and there were places for the larval salamanders to live. I found that some insect species are only found in the older native forests. That means if you take that forest down, those insect species are going to become extinct in that area. Some snail species only found in older forests. This little snail is found only in old growth forests. We did not know this five years ago. This was a master's degree student that just decided that he was going to compare the, the snail populations in the old growth forest to the managed forest. Many bird species do better in the older forest. These are the ones I was talking about that need the cavities. They need the big curling bark. Yes, there are some types of birds that do better in early successional, but we've got plenty of that around now and not as much of the older forest. There are more lichen species in the older native forests including these tiny little things I'd never even heard about before, these calesioid lichens. And the older the forest is, the more of those calesioid lichen species you will have in that forest. More wildflower plant diversity in the older forest. Often we see these forests cut and we're told, oh, well, they'll recover. But we have never seen full recovery of herbaceous plant diversity after a forest has been managed or timbered. Even after hundreds of years, the full herbaceous plant diversity does not come back. And this graph just kind of, you know, you can squint in your eyes, and on the left is the old growth forest, and on the right is the second growth forest. These are a lot of different plant species, and you can see both the numbers and the variety are higher in the old growth. Moss species, same thing, older forest, more moss species, more mushroom species in older native forests. So if you like mushroom diversity, that's where you're going to find them. And we're just learning now about the ways that the trees communicate to each other through this mycelial network, connecting their roots. So this is Suzanne Samard's work in British Columbia. How many of you are familiar with her and her work? Ah, you guys got to read some more. Listen to her TED Talk on YouTube. Um, the circles represent Douglas fir trees. The darker the green, the older the tree. And the black represents these fungal species, fungal genets, really, um, connecting these trees. So the older a tree is, the more connected it's going to be with the other trees in that forest. And they can move not only nutrients along this mycelial network, they can move chemicals that communicate so that one tree can, in a way, speak, um, share information with another tree that will then change its chemistry in response. We're just learning this stuff. So all of that summarized, I said, I say the healthiest forest is an unmanaged forest that's just left alone. Now, of course, yes, we can't, maybe we can't leave them all alone. We need some places that the forests are crops, but we should be 
definitely leaving more of them alone if we care about biodiversity. So this graph here is called the Living Planet Index, done by the World Wildlife Fund. And they said, there should be some way to measure global biodiversity. How can we do that? And so they developed a program where they would interview different scientists and say, how is your organism doing this year? Like if you're studying snails of a certain kind, are they increasing, are they decreasing, are there more, are there less? And the scientists would report back and they put the data in and every year there'd be a new data point. They had to start somewhere. They started in 1970 and said, we'll call that zero you know, meaning, or one here in this graph, meaning this is our baseline, and our biodiversity has been decreasing since then. Why is biodiversity decreasing? Well, because habitat is decreasing. So when we disturb these native places. Why does that matter? We've got one of these, right? We've got one of these. We're sharing it. And we are reducing its complexity, reducing its beauty in my eyes. And we are a part of that biodiversity complex. And so we're pulling out those Jenga pieces underneath, and it's eventually going to affect us. It already has. So what do we do about that? Easy from my point of view. You know, I'm speaking for the trees. I say we need to retain some of these older native forests, and we need to build a community of people who care about them, right? It's not enough just to save the forest, because without us caring about them, those forests are going to go away. I mean, think about in that past, in the 1800s, think if there was a community of people who really cared about saving more of that old growth. We'd have more of it now. So it's our turn. We've got to try it now. And not just the forests, but I want you to think of the thing that you want to speak for. You know, maybe you're the salamander advocate, <laughs> and you need to talk, speak for them. They can't vote. They can't get up here on the podium. They can't write books. Or maybe you're the, um, you know, the, the red bat advocate or whatever. We all need to speak for these species and advocate for them if we're going to keep a living, healthy planet. And that is my Earth Day message. Thank you. Yes, would you, anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer a few questions. Or, yes. How do you feel about the management of invasive species in the forest? Uh, the question, how do I feel about the management of invasive species in the forest? Excellent question. And I will tell you that I have seen that problem grow um, since I've been doing this work. You know, in the last 10 years, it's, it's gotten a lot worse. So, um, the forests that are in the old growth forest network, we don't specify how they're actually managed as long as that they're not logged. And so some of those forests are being, the re invasives are being actively removed, and in others they aren't. It just depends on the resources and the inclination of those people. Um, my feeling about it is, for one, that's one reason we don't want to do some of this management. You know, in the past, there was a lot of thinning going on, and it was like, oh, yes, this is good. It'll make the trees grow faster. Well, now, when you thin, you're letting light in, and you're increasing the invasive species. And then what do you do? Well, if you want to manage, then you're spraying herbicides. That's not good for any of those soil organisms. So you can get yourself in a bind with the management. Sometimes it's better not to do the management because of the invasives. But once the invasives are there, I think it's a matter of balance. I think if there's not many, and I think if you have the resources to remove them, you should. I think it's better for the forest. But if it's an overwhelming situation, and it would mean a lot of using a lot of heavy chemicals, um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really one of those that um, would fault people who decide that they 
can't handle that and they're just going to see what happens. Yeah, I think it'll, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in some cases. Any other questions? Right. Oh, um, the similarities between the old growth forests, meaning why they're there or how they look? Or oh, how they came to be there. Oh, okay. Um, it's not because, not, not necessarily because they're in the middle of nowhere. I had always heard because there were, uh, there were on, you know, the topography was really rugged or there were mistakes in in surveying, I'd heard things like that, and there is some of that. But more often, it just happened to be a particular family that really loved that forest and was dedicated to protecting that and for more than one generation. And then eventually, those forests got somehow handed off, sold to another organization, agency like the state, or like the Nature Conservancy, something like that. So the, the forest that I just dedicated in Wisconsin, it was in an area, um, this family moved there, the husband was in charge of the logging operations of the whole large area. And logging was happening and railroads were going in and the trees were coming down. And this man's wife, uh, Mrs. Holt, she would bring her children to the forest every Sunday and they'd, recreate and she'd read them stories in the forest bible stories or other stories and she said to her husband you will not log that forest <laughs> and he didn't and that family held on to that piece of forest for three generations and until they made sure that it was handed off to the um become part of the national forest and as a state natural area in the national forest. So a lot of forests are protected by individuals. And that's another point. Um, you know, it's, the government is not necessarily doing this work. Um, so it's more up to us, more up to the people. So if you do have the resources, you have the money, you can buy a forest and protect it, that's great too. Okay, maybe more. Okay, I think that's good. Oh, oh yeah, Chris. So Joan's second book was called Among the Ancients, and that's the book where she traveled around to 26 eastern states. And uh, I, I wrote a review of that book when I lived in Wisconsin, and I remember thinking, like, we look horrible. Like, w like right, your impression of Wisconsin was there's like one or two old trees. So I'm just curious, like, what your, what your assessment is today now that you've sort of learned more. And I, I would like an honest, like, like don't, don't soft sell it because we're in Wisconsin. <laughs> Tell me the truth. What, what, how are we doing? All right, I'll tell you the truth. Um, it's pretty sad, isn't it? I mean, it's sad a lot of places, but it's pretty sad here, too. It's really sad when you look at these giant old white pines that you had, especially, and the big hemlocks. I mean, that's what I um, saw when I went to Cathedral Woods. You know, I saw what the majority of this state did look like. And now, when I ride around, I'm not seeing any of that. So it feels kind of leak to me but one hopeful point is I think your state natural areas program is pretty active not all of those natural areas are forest but that's one place where there are some bits of forest protected but yeah overall this is not a great place to live if you're really into seeing the old growth forests <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I'm happy to sign any books out there and um, to remind you to join the network of people who care about for us and thank all the wonderful people, Chris especially, and the sustainability um, group here and who has invited me and welcomed me, so thank you.